You're listening to Mom and Doc Talk, where we talk all things healing pans and pandas with an emphasis on homeopathy. Hi, I'm Jody the mom. And I'm Dr. By the Doc, and welcome to Mom and Doc Talk. We have a great guest for you today, just following in the last couple of conversations that we've had about mold and impacts of mold illness and, and mold as it relates to pans and pandas. And we have uh, Michael Schranz with us today to talk to us about um, remediation. And we've got so many um, really great questions for him that we want to just dive right in and not waste any time. So let me do a quick introduction so you guys know why we invited him here. Um, I this is, a, this is actually my first time ever talking to him. He presented at the Medical Academy for Pediatric Special Needs, and I was so impressed with his talk that I jumped on immediately immediately after and sent him an email and he was gracious enough to come and join me uh, for our, our um, episode today. So Michael Schrantz is the owner and operator of Environmental Analytics LLC located in Tucson, Arizona. Environmental Analytics is a comprehensive indoor environmental quality consulting company that covers a wide range of environmental assessments for the residential, commercial, and medical sectors. Mr. Schrantz has over 26 years of active indoor environmental quality and building science experience. He's been involved in over 6,000 related projects expanding across the globe. He is a board certified indoor environmental consultant and a board certified microbial investigator through the American Council for Accredited Certification. Mr. Schrantz is highly recommended by treating physicians across the globe for his work with patients suffering from various forms of chronic illness, including Sears, MCAS, MCS, SIBO, PANS, PANDAS, ALS, AD, and Lyme disease. He is highly involved in his industry, serving as a board member for the ACAC, um, ICA, uh, and uh, so ISEAI, and an actively involved member with the Surviving Mold and Sears communities. He is a published author of Spore Trap Analysis and MPQ PCR Methods and has co-authored multiple publications and papers. Mr. Schrant spends countless hours in consulting efforts, volunteers hundreds of hours every year to help educate the public, including his own podcast, ieprradio.com. He is an active speaker at industry-related conferences and workshops throughout the world. Uh, Mr. Schrantz can be contacted at mike at environmentalanalytics.net um, and Environmental Analytics, and I'll put the link to the websites and everything in our show notes so you can just access them there really easily. Um, welcome, Michael. We are so grateful. Like I'm, uh, after you know going through your bio, I'm sure everybody can understand and Jody can understand too I, as the mom here why I said, okay, we need to get this guy in to talk about um, remediation. So let's just go ahead and get um, get started. Welcome. Yes, thank you both for having me. I appreciate the introduction. I always hate hearing information about myself. I'm, yes. I'm humbled, but I appreciate that. And I look forward to trying to tackle these questions with you guys today. So I'm always curious why people do what they do. So what made you decide to go into this field? I think originally it was, uh, I wouldn't say by accident, but I was working at 16 years old with a family owned air conditioning company. Uh, there was a division in indoor air quality learning about airflow. At the time, I didn't think I was going to be uh, doing this. Um, but what the, the the shorter version of a much longer story is that I started to see that we were going out to jobs and solving issues, problems, complaints of indoor air quality that standard inspectors were not solving. And I guess it was a feeling of validation, a feeling of worth and value. And uh, as I went through uh, high school and then to college, I just really grew an affinity being able to go out and solve problems. I've always been a critical thinker, uh, can be a blessing and a curse, depending on what side of that uh, blade uh, you are on. Mm -hmm. But um, it's very helpful in this industry because it's not black and white, as many of you listening are already aware, doing your research that if it was one quick little pill, one quick little button, you would have already pressed it and you wouldn't be needing to listen to this. So mm -hmm. I just found myself fascinated with the idea of how can we harness this better, understand it and really grew a passion. And you know, fast forward to today, I've had many opportunities working with great colleagues and clinicians and all of that and found that this seems to be the place for me that I fit best. So that's, that's my passion piece. It almost sounds like the way you described is almost like a healer, like a, a, a healer of your surroundings and, and like an indirect healer for people. So I tend to be the, the, that type of person. I'm, you know, if you're into horoscopes, I'm a cancer and, you know, I tend to just find myself really trying to, um, bring unity and consensus and understanding and context. I think that's what's missing in life in general, but also just with what we're here today to talk about. So yeah, I, I find them, I, I fit pretty well in this line of work and um, look forward to being able to, you know, solve a lot more problems out there, including some of these remediation challenges that we're dealing with. Yeah. 
Well, I I have to first say before I ask any questions at all that I'm sure every single Pan's mom that's listening right now, as soon as they heard who you were, were like, oh, because this is something that is such a thing that's on our mind all the time. So again, just super appreciate you being here and willing to answer questions because this is something that's very near and dear to so many of us. Um, so what should people look for that suggests they might have a mold problem in their home? Yeah, it's tricky, right? I mean, um, just to spitball a few things, normally by the time people reach out to us, it's because there's some sort of a health picture. Mm -hmm. uh, they're symptomatic. There's something about them that is not right, and that usually triggers it. But obviously, you know, pe most people like to think that they can wake up in the morning if they don't feel bad, that there's nothing to think about. So a lot of times that is the trigger point. That's literally that. If something's not right, I feel off, I'm brain fatigued, uh, or you know, some, something going on that triggers the thing to go, why is it going on? But I mean, if you if 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 mold is the million dollar question and we're trying to narrow it down into a residence, a home, that type of thing, you know, a lot of times it's like, well, do we see things? Do we smell things? Is it humid in the house? Um, are there are there conditions conducive for microbial growth? Because we're surrounded, uh, which I know is actually a, a question that's possibly coming up, but is um, what is our goal? Right. It's like normal fungal ecology. We live on this place called Earth. And we're surrounded by mold spores and mold fragments and mycotoxins. And we're breathing some of those in right now as we're having this interview and as you're listening right now. But that's, we can dive deeper as we need to in that point, but that's normal fungal ecology. So what we're looking for is when it's not that, when it's elevated or it's atypical with a type of mold species that might be more indicative of a mold problem, you don't always see it. You don't always smell it. So if it's a low hanging fruit, like, oh, wow, there's a strong musty odor and it's coming from the crawl space, that might be an easy way, an easy example to say you should pursue this further. But if there's not smells and things of that nature, how are you testing for it? How are you looking for it before you even get a professional involved? And for me, one of the biggest things to look for is evidence of elevated moisture in the home. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um. So I love that you brought up immediately that there are, that there's just the normal fungal ecology, because that's one of the things we have so many people, and we hear from so many people in our community that we need to have a mold free space. And it's like, that's just not really possible, is it? No, no. I think that terms meant well, but definitely misused and abused. Um, mold free, I think is how the, con the industry does mean it is normal background levels, not elevated levels like mold growing on a wall or coming from a wall or something like that. But it gets very confusing when a clinician or somebody in a position of responsibility, somebody of influence says mold free. I, I happen to dislike that term because of all the confusion we get. I literally have clients that come out to me and they'll be like, I'm looking for a mold free environment. And when you talk to them, you find out that they literally mean a mold free environment. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, it's no wonder you're having limbic system issues, never mind anything else. You look at the way that you're reacting to one single mold spore. That is to say, by data, by sampling, all that that you're reacting to. So, no, we our goal is normal fungal ecology, and normal fungal ecology varies. It varies from home to home, day to day, season to season, the type of lifestyle you live. Do you have carpeting in the house? Do you have hard flooring on the house? There's so many things that can influence it, but you might say that there's a range, and there's a way to help determine whether your house reflects normal fungal ecology. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I'm sure that that just like sprang a whole bunch of question marks for people, including me. So sure. what is, yeah, what is normal and how do you figure that out, especially if it's yeah. variable? Fair enough. Um, so uh, one of the ways that we determine what's normal is with control data. So do we have outdoor control data of the home or the residents to say, well, this is what we would expect to find in the home. There's other other uh, IEPs like myself who will use things like historical data. I've taken thousands of EMSQ PCR samples. I've taken thousands of spore trap samples, et cetera, et cetera. And you're used to seeing trends in like, say, your local, say, your city or something like that. But you got to be careful with those sorts of things, right? Because um, if I know that Tucson proper has average levels of a particular mold outdoors, that doesn't mean that it's going to be that level in your actual home. What if you have a a source outside of the home that is kicking up that particular species and it gives you essentially a false positive. So the main thing is control data. And that even includes some of the ERMI samples that you're familiar with, like sampling out, um, sampling in the home. A lot of people never thought, well, what about sampling outside of the home? That's mm -hmm. one of the things that we do a lot of is to get an idea of what's normal for this home. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, another question sort of in that vein is all are all molds equally problematic? So since there's like a normal ecology, are there, are there some that are not quite as problematic as others? Such a juicy question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and I'll try to be proper with this response for you. Um, so it is true that there's a lot of uh, research done on certain species uh, to determine their toxicity, um, may maybe their um, ability to have um, to create some sort of a, a reaction, an allergenic type reaction in a person. But there's no such thing, at least not that I'm aware of, and I have pretty good resources that has a cheat sheet that says this mold species you can eat for breakfast uh, in a bowl and be fine. This one, if a spore lands on your face, you know, your ear is going to fall off. There's, I know it's a bit ex extreme, but to illustrate the point that there's no cheat sheet that says that it's okay to avoid these and avoid uh, and, 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 and be okay around these ones. I think that there are, is some um, confusion because there are, again, people of influence, whether clinical or celebrity type status, where they'll say something to insinuate like, yeah, it's elevated, but it's just cladosporium. And that's a common outdoor mold or can be a common outdoor mold, depending on the species. And so therefore you should have no problem. But the way I see it in the experience with um, working with cl uh, clients, with working with clinicians and colleagues is that someone can react uh, in, from an inflammatory uh, standpoint, from a toxigenic standpoint, from a general allergy standpoint, and, uh, in a significant way, if it's mold A, like Cladosporium cladosporides one, which is a type of species, or Stachybotrys chitarum, which most people know of as the Tom Cruise celebrity mold, because it's the black mold, it's the toxic mold that everybody thinks about. Even if you don't know the name Stachybotrys chitarum, you'll know those other terms. Yeah. And we don't have a sheet that says that one of those are, are worse to you than others. I think that that's part of the problem is that we can't look at a person even today at their genetics and go, you number one, you could see the nightmare with this. Even if you could do this, which you can't, you wouldn't be able to look at somebody and go, Well, you're fine with this mold, but you're definitely not fine with this mold from an inflammatory standpoint. Not the same as the doctor skin prick test on your back. That's not the same thing. But even if you could do that, like maybe in the future, we'll get into that level of genetic understanding to where we could. Can you imagine the nightmare with that? What's that going to lead to? Like, ah, eh, we would have remediated that mold in that bedroom, but it wasn't the species that can affect me. Can you imagine oh the type of downfall issues that you'd run into? So traditionally to land this airplane of thought, most people are going to treat all molds ex the same way in terms of if we feel it's elevated. If it's a source, no matter what species it is, we're going to treat it the same way. We're not prejudiced. Yeah. I love that this really connects to, uh, as we were talking about before we got started recording, our area of expertise, which is homeopathy. And then there's lots of different ways that, you know, homeopathy like branches out into other things. Homeopathy really addresses the susceptibility and the specific reactivity to whatever the hap the trigger happens to be. And that, you know, people can have, um, you know, respiratory symptoms as, as a re reaction to mold or skin symptoms or neuropsychiatric symptoms, lots of different ways of presentations, and they can have different degrees of susceptibility. So you, some people can be susceptible to that single spore. Um, some, some people need to have it like growing all over the walls and like crawling into their ears to start to get really reactive to it. Um, and so the reality is that there's, it's likely to, I mean, I've never tested this because we've, we haven't gotten into like that level of specificity, but it could be that there's some people who are more reactive to something that's considered to be like a less reactive species, but they are just more susceptible to that particular one in general too. And good, and good luck figuring that out. And by the yeah. time you've done doing it, the person's like, I could have remediated my house or cleaned my house three times over. Why am I spending yeah. thousands upon thousands of dollars to answer a question that we're not quite sure? And there is the balance of the issue is it's like, yeah, we agree. We wish we could be that specific because we all want answers. As somebody who suffers from my own form of chronic illness, which is CIRS, I know that it's a struggle. And I, I know that um, I know that I wish I could just say, just tell me what it is and what I should be worried about that because we want that warm blanket response. We want that comfort. Yeah. We want that peace, that feeling of safety. But um, again, to go back to the earlier point too is, that's why we're looking for normal fungal ecology. And if we determine that, because this matters, right? Because your body's been acclimated. We've seen people that have moved from East Coast to West Coast. They find a house that, quote unquote, is not water damaged, doesn't have mold, but yet they're reacting worse. And through some level of research or, or testing kind of has been loosely concluded that, hey, it might just be because of the flora, the variety of species that are available that your body's just not immune, uh, used to that, doesn't have the um, immune bodies or whatever, uh, the antigens, whatever whatever topic you want to get into to really be able to respond to that. 
So our hope is that we can look at the home that you're in and say, well, listen, this is what we would expect to find in your home. And here's the problem. We're not finding that in this particular bedroom or this particular kitchen area. Let's dive deeper and see if we can find the source because perhaps that's where your exposure is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's interesting because I see so many families say, oh, well, we got out of the mold house, but we're still having problems. You could potentially just be moving into a different type of problem. And yeah. that's where addressing the susceptibility comes in and, and fixing the body on the inside. And that um, awareness, that awareness, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Joe. Uh, no, 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 go. The, the point, uh, another point to it is, is also like what you just said and having that moment of pause where we're, we as professionals are saying, well, is it the home or is it some sort of an acclimation period adjustment? In other words, let's not have you freak out over the house that you just moved into your example. Yeah. And let's really take a closer look at that. Does that mean we should just blindly ignore the house and not assess it? Well, of course not. But we need yeah. to be open-minded because we're seeing these patterns. And it makes me wonder, does it always have to be? I know we're here because of a moldy home. But in these situations, we do see times where we can't find any evidence of it. We have tested it. We have looked at it. And there's nothing there. But you know what it is? It's a different climate from where they came. They went from a hot and dry to a humid and and, and hot. And that's those are two different types of worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and adjusting to that normal fungal ecology, right? Like that, mm -hmm. like that is a minimum threshold that we can live with is like the normal fungal ecology. And for some people, it might be that you, that some people can tolerate the normal fungal ecology of like where I am in San Diego. Um, and some people can't, and they need to live in a place that's more arid, like Tucson, um, because the, the, what their tolerance and their susceptibility that which, which type of, which level of normal fungal ecology is okay for them. And Jody's right. I mean, uh, the other the other part to it to, to to add to that is that, you know, it could just be where you're at, you know, the whole term of how full is your bucket. I mean, if there's got mm -hmm. if there needs to be some detoxing and your bucket's full, it might not matter where you live. Yeah. So it, yeah. it just it's all it's it's a big picture. It's not just it's not just the the testing. I'm sorry, it's not just the treatment of the body, it's not just knowing the environment. It's 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 a village, it's the whole piece. Yeah. yeah. All those pieces. Um, what about um, one of the number one Pan's mom question is what do I do for testing? And there's lots of different opinions. I'm curious to know um, what what tests you trust. Sure, I, I saw that question earlier, and I um I, I jokingly said to myself, I don't trust any of them, and I trust all of them. <laughs> like it just depends on what we're talking about. Um, uh, it is true that um, if you do any research on me that I tend to be a fan of MSQ PCR, um, mold specific polymerase chain reaction, quantitative polymerase chain reaction, which basically is to most people who maybe don't know that they may refer to it as an ERMI. Now ERMI uses that technology. Um, and I happen to be a fan of that particular type of testing because it's very sensitive. Um, it's not just looking at a big fat mold spore that might settle out in a sedentary environment like a home, unless there's huge exposures or so, let's just say significant, um, or I should say significant concentrations to be correct, but it also identifies fragments. So if you look up any of the studies and we have plenty of them for every one mold spore, depending on the study, you'll see anything from like 300 to a thousand fragments. There's way more fragments then there are spores in any given environment. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because mold's organic, it breaks down, like skin flakes, like just it fragments. And uh, a lot of the more traditional testing, like spore trap analysis, petri dish sampling, will not identify that it can't. Um, the other thing we like about um, MSQ PCR sampling is that it can speciate. Um, it, you know, a lot we've seen many times where an inspector will come out, real quick example, and they'll say, well, yeah, you're, you're, if you've done spore trap sampling in the past, you've heard the term aspergillus penicillium grouped together, or maybe they're called aspen um, as a grouping, which represents thousands upon thousands of species of mold, by the way. And they'll say, well, we tested your indoor and we tested your outdoor, but your indoor was lower than your outdoor. So therefore, you quote unquote, don't have a problem. Therefore, your home reflects normal fungal ecology to tie that in. But here's the problem. Then we do a supplemental sampling where we speciate the mold. We find out that the species that was in the house was a species that's not well represented outside. In fact, you do have a problem in the house. It does not reflect normal fungal ecology, but it just wasn't able to differentiate that issue in those testing. So I do like that. But to be fair, you know, there's other tests that have really good value too. Like for example, with Petri dish sampling, um, especially some of the DIY options that are out there. Uh, you have the potential to do multiple places for a fraction of the cost, right? Because that's one of the downsides to yeah. the ERMI samples is the cost. It could be anywhere, depending on the lab on average, between $240 and $300 per sample. And that's your own, that's like direct from the lab. And so 
sometimes we'll be working in situations where budget's an issue and we'll say, well, let's see if we can at least do a bunch of Petri dish samples to get a basic framework of what's going on. We just have to remember some of those points I made earlier um, about the limitations of Petri dish sampling, but they have their place. What I love about Petri dish sampling too is if you do both, if you do MSQ, PCR, DNA testing, you typically dust samples and uh, Petri dish sampling, it not only can help um, pick up problems that maybe one sample, what if the mold's airborne? What if it just doesn't settle out that? What if a new active leak uh, going on creating active growth that's not really well represented on the settled surfaces, but it is in the air. I've had plenty of cases where one or the other picked it up, not both necessarily. So if you're listening going, okay, Mike, you said all that great stuff. Now, what, what, what's the conclusion? I think the conclusion is that you need to work with a professional and you, need to, and you need to look at your individual situation and determine what the best test is. No different than saying, what is the best binder? What is the best supplements that I should take to help support my GI track Why I'm going through all of this? The answer is it depends. Um, but if I only could pick one, I would pick probably the ERMI, the MSQ PCR analysis. Okay. What do you uh, What do you think about the dog? I see post about so-and-so mold dog is traveling yeah. around. Get your appointment now. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, I guess a couple of different angles. The first angle is I think the mold dogs can be a great tool. Um, just like a moisture meter, just like an infrared camera that can be helpful. A dog can be another angle uh, to help identify sources um, that are uh, otherwise hidden that you wouldn't be able to pick up ironically necessarily with a moisture meter or even with a pair of eyeballs and a, and a nice flashlight. The counterpoint to it is, is what we see a lot with uh, the mold dogs is that they'll sit down or mark an area over the most mundane topical thing and creates more of a headache of, uh, especially if the um, handler of the dog writes a report that is just more like, here's what we found and you kind of deal with it. It's that's like not helpful because now you have a homeowner that had a dog that sat down at their, say for example, let's pick on one, like a shower wall where there's topical growth. Okay, we'll clean it off. Doesn't mean we have to rip the shower apart. Um, and so it can, um, what I see in short is I see a lot of exaggerated positives, like they did identify something, but it's so minute and, and so minor, the dog can't go roof or, or bark three or four times to represent square footage or depth or volume. So you're really <laughs> left with uh, a great tool needing an excellent interpreter of what the dog is finding to help you understand, well, do I have a problem or not? But I would never play, replace the mold dog or rather uh, MSQ PCR sampling with the mold dog, what I would say is I'd like to have both if I could. Mm -hmm. Ah, Okay, that makes sense. Because I feel like we're always looking for like the quickest route to the most definite answer. And it's like, do I huh. test my kid's body? Do I do a Petri dish? And that doesn't give me any information about what is in other rooms or so it's kind of a combination of everything that is the most of, of you know, it can be a combination of multiple tests that will be the most beneficial and the quickest route. I'll be, I'll make it clear to absolutely resonate with you, Jody, that, you know, I, wow. I, we, yes, we want it done quickly as possible. We want your answers yesterday, but if it was that easy, mm -hmm. even some of these shyster companies out there that are just in it to make money, would already have some program that you could buy something you could purchase that you know, after you purchase it, it's just that one and done. The problem yeah. is, is that we live on earth where mold is a normal background, a requirement for the survival of our earth in many aspects. And so it's kind of like saying, it's like sorting through the, trying to find the needle in the haystack. You might say it's trying to find a piece of hay in the haystack and saying, well, which pieces of these hay are too much and too little. We know we got to have some, and so it's very tricky. And then to the points you ladies made earlier, what if you're just uniquely different? I mean, this house worked for one person who was, um, let's say, susceptible, but it didn't work for another person. Does that mean that it didn't work for the other person that they have to do more remediation? Well, we'll get into that a little bit deeper, I'm sure, when we ask some more questions. But the answer is you might not have a problem, formally speaking, that requires the ripping out of cabinets or the ripping out of walls. It might just be some more proactive things we can do to improve the indoor air quality to really help make that exposure concern as low as possible to help get you through that hump of getting better quicker. 
But we've got tons of questions for you about all of the things like with remediation, prevention, and all of that. So I can't wait to dive into that. So let's shift gears um, just because we've seen so many things in our community that shared, um, much like Jody just said, like with the mold sniffing dog. One of the things that I've seen, like, let's say people are like, okay, there's mold in, even if they don't, they have like taken care of and they don't have any reason to suspect that there's mold in their home, but they know that the mold count is high in the environment and they're worried about just exposure to that. We've seen some people post things about like mold killing candles. Like, do those, or, or like oils and stuff like that. Do, do any of those actually work? Um, and is it and is and is it even beneficial? Because like I, I've read several books about mold, and most of the things assert that dead mold is just as bad for you as living mold. So does it even benefit you to use those, even if they work? So first and foremost, do they work? And then yeah, it- I, yeah, sure. To your latter point, by the way, the last point you made is is a huge one. Um, to your first point, um. I don't, I haven't seen the third party studies Mm -hmm. that have shown the, what you're saying is efficacy if we're talking about killing. So I haven't seen anything that shows, oh, wow, yes, in an ambient environment, if you light this uh, candle with a small little flame going, it somehow is able to send something out to kill mold um, in various locations of of the home. Uh, um, I haven't seen the studies, number one, uh, to support that. I've seen in-house marketing of it. The second thing is, is it begs the question of is, well, what was the study that was done? And does it reflect reality? Like if it was done in an 18 inch cube chamber and there was mold present and somehow they did a before and after, assuming that the test methods were even fair, that's not the same as the environment you live in. And number number two or three, even if it could do that, you'd really would beg the question, what is it that I'm putting in my house? Hear me out. This part's important. That has the ability to kill or or otherwise inactivate a mold spore to break down its cellular structure, but somehow doesn't affect my sensitive lung tissues. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, to your last point that you had made is uh, dead or alive mold still, I mean, this this part's even on the EPA, uh, is still allergenic, potentially toxigenic, and can create that inflammatory response. For many of you that are familiar with this, it's the inflammation in our body. It's what a lot of people experience when they get COVID. Um, it's the inflammatory, it's the markers, it's the body having all this inflammation that's going to exist where, whether the mold is a letter, uh, is alive or dead. So if you killed the mold, maybe the only thing that you've really prevented it doing is from growing again, but I got news for you. You don't need mold in your house. That's growing to create additional areas of for mold growth in the future. We live on earth. We're surrounded by mold spores. The only thing you can really control in your environment to prevent mold from growing is moisture, which is why I mentioned it earlier on, because even if you if you don't control moisture and you really cleaned your house, you're still going to have a viable mold spore that lands on it, and you'll still have nutrients that are available, some better than others, for it to grow. So no, I, I wouldn't use that as a resource. I understand that it looks good, it markets good, but until we get the really robust third-party studies that show it in real-life application working with robust studies, including... And, and their claim is to kill, so it's not necessarily to remove. And that's actually a really red flag right there as well. If all you're doing is killing it, it's still there. Right. And you have to remove those point, those other concerns. Well, and there's so many, um, as I recall from all the reading that I've done, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there are many molds that are worse for us because of our interventions that we try to use that are inappropriate. So like they're reacting to the chemicals we have in our environment. So they're trying, it's basically we're fighting them and they're fighting back. They're fighting for their lives. And like, we're reacting to the toxins they're releasing as we're, they're reacting to like the chemicals that we use in our our daily environment. And so in some cases we could be making it even worse depending on what it is that's being used. If it's making the mold actually fight for its life. Yeah, it's 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 the same similar concept to the flu virus, right? We have different strains that come out and it evolves. COVID's the same way, you know, it 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 it's just develops and it grows. And there is argument that like anti uh, fungals, um, how uh, or even with like stuff with bacteria, how it becomes a, a MRSA, like it becomes a strain that eventually, if you keep on messing with it, it's going to get evolved and adapt, uh, which is the basic premise of like evolution and and cause potential issues. Now, I don't know. Well, I think qualitatively that's true. I don't know an application if that's actually our biggest issue. Meanwhile, we got a ton of mold growing, whether whichever strain it is, we're more worried about that than did we kill it. But I do agree that it becomes a very valuable, to your point, issue when people are starting to spray stuff to kill. A little bit different from the candle, but antimicrobials, antifungals, fungistats, things like that. 
uh, what we're seeing is causing way more complication than solutions. Yeah. I think one thing it was just really important to make sure that we point out that you've, you mentioned again, again, and again, normal fungal ecology. I'm, I have really con big concerns and I'll just leave it there and we can move on to the next things that I know that our parents want to hear about, but I have big concerns that we are heading in the anti-parasitic and anti-fungal realm, the same way we did with antibiotics, where we're overdoing some things and we're going to create a lot more problems because we're we're trying to force our way and like clear up what is actually normal flora and is meant to be there has beneficial impacts um, that we're going to go overboard and create a whole different set of, set of problems trying to deal with problems right now. I'll let you jump into your questions, Jenner, but, but I'll just say two things. Number one, goosebumps. That's what I just got. And number two, um, um, you, I don't think, you know, I think you do how how much that is accurate and and that it, it covers more than just the stuff that we're covering today i think that we sometimes get in our own way or at least certain people in the industry and we complicate the damn thing to where really yeah. where we're going in is to a state of robotic uh, like we need people and inputs to tell us what to do and and trust those limited understandings and really we're complicating things not to mention like what you said with spraying so you'll find that a lot of the theme to my answers uh, uh supports the idea of not doing that yeah yeah. I'm uh, I'm going to try and hide the guilty look on my face when I ask this question. Um is <laughs> should remediation ever be done yourself without the help of a professional? Sure. Um I I think there's there's two answers, right? The the easy answer is no, use a qualified professional. There's there there's a reason they're out there and statistically speaking, um in my experience when people do it DIY Something typically fails. The containment didn't hold up right. They thought they cleaned enough, but they didn't. I'm actually dealing with a DIY issue or a semi DIY um, um, uh, a cleaning service company involved uh, issue right now, and 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 that we're running into an issue where they did repeat testing. It looks uh, almost worse than the originals. Um, I think there's situations though when if you live in Podunk, Alaska, or Podunk, Montana. Or if you just don't have the resources, um, those people that hear somebody like myself, oh my gosh, of course you should use a mold remediation company, feel helpless. And 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 good news, you don't have to. Um, there are. Uh, I, I'm a realist. I I I think we don't have to deal with hiding behind a textbook and best practices. It, we want those for a reason, and they cover 90, 95, maybe even more percent of the time. But what about you, that person that's listening right now that just doesn't have the resource? And I don't mean because you're not open minded. If you're closed minded, or you heard from Becky or Bob, your next door neighbor, that they had one bad experience. So now all remediation companies are horrible. That's not being open minded. But if you legitimately don't have the resources, and we see this enough, then I would what we would definitely recommend is if you're going to do DIY, you work with a professional like myself. I'm not here to market myself today, but just to say people like me, we can talk about other resources of where to find people like me to um to really guide you. And I'm literally doing that with one client right now because they are literally in a place where there is nobody within a driving distance to go through. It's just not realistic to have them. They can't. And so we're down to getting friends and family and colleagues and workers to help do the project. And there's nothing that um, there's nothing in the statutes that say that you can't do that, at least for residential homes. Yeah. Well, it's good to know that you could be a resource for people who yeah. might not yeah. have it's yeah. it's more hands-on it's a little bit slower we were talking mm -hmm. about wanting to have an answer yesterday and have solutions mm -hmm. but it's better than doing nothing especially if you have the ability to do something yeah i think that we like with my family in particular we 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 did it ourselves um but we ended up paying for it in our own health because we made ourselves significantly sicker doing it um, yeah. so it's kind of a balancing act it is it is yeah so let's assume that we're talking to people who don't need to do this on their own, who have the resources. How can they know if a remediation company is actually good? Yeah, it's a great, fair question, great question, sometimes difficult question, because on one hand, I can say, well, make sure they have certifications. But what does that mean? I know people with PhDs that shouldn't be doing the work they're doing and with the same per different person with a high school education that could run circles around that PhD. Mm -hmm. But I do agree that we have to cross some basic, we have to check off some basic boxes. Uh, number one um, is uh, what are their certifications? Um, do they, uh, for example, um, the American, American Council for Accredited, Accredited Certifications or ACAC.org, um, didn't mean to butcher that. Um, they have a credit, accredited certification. What that means in plain English is anybody can create a certification. For those of you listening, you can create a certification and have a nice little glossy to hand out to the people. But if it's accredited, that means a third party has gone through the rigors of testing it and the metrics that you've used to really give it real value, real weight. Well, the ACAC 
has accredited certifications for remediators. And so being able to um, have that as a foot in the door type thing. I think the other thing that you can do is try to focus on companies that don't use chemicals. And what I mean by that is the, anti the antifungals, the, the antimicrobials, um, people that rely heavily on chemicals for any big process. Now, don't get me wrong. Water is a chemical uh, or certainly dish soap and water is, which we do support for damp wiping of surfaces. But you want to find a company that is open minded, that they're willing to say, OK, yeah, no, we, we won't use that antimicrobial. We normally apply this on here. It's like we don't want that. Um, and we can get into the weeds of why that is the case and ask them those questions. Um, two more thoughts or resources is. Are they going to, well, three, are they going to give you a protocol, not an estimate? Most people, they get an estimate, but it doesn't give you the order of what they're doing. It just says this costs that much, the Tyvek costs this much, the plastic costs this much, but they don't give you any sense of order. So what you want to do is get a step-by-step -step protocol. You want to ask for it. Thank you for my estimate. Can you please give me a step-by-step -step protocol of what you're planning on doing? And the reason for that is, is maybe you're wise enough, maybe you're um, educated enough to look at that and go, whoa. Whoa, where are they fogging this chemical for? Where'd that come from? That wasn't really mentioned clearly in the estimate. And you can figure that out. It also gives you the ability to work with a professional like myself or others so we can go through it. I do that probably once or twice a week with clients around the globe where I'm looking at protocols that are written and saying, okay, we like that. We like that. Let's change this because there isn't a... a well, there isn't a mold police, right? There isn't law enforcement that breaks down the remediator's wall and says, you can't do that. There's so much wiggle room out there. It's the wild west. We have companies that are in the remediation business that are promoting fogging houses with harsh chemicals to kill in lieu of physical source removal remediation. It's causing all kinds of headaches um, in multiple ways because people are still having issues and it's an attractive thing to people because it's like, well, you mean I don't have to like remove walls and it costs a third of the price? Why wouldn't you want to do that as a lay person? Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll tell you is two, two resources to help minimize or maximize rather finding the right company is go on IEP radio. It's free mm -hmm. and watch that four-part remediation series because it, 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 I probably am due to do like a new one, an updated one, which I plan, I, I have a sense is going to come soon. But um, I, it really gives you the fundamentals so you can be your own ambassador. You can't rely on the remediation company per se. I mean, there's some good ones out there, but how do you know if they're a good one or not? You want to educate yourself and say, okay, this is what containment looks like. This is what negative air containment looks like. This is what physical removal looks like. This is what cleaning looks like. These are what you should do. The other thing, which is totally brand new, and I, I don't want to speak prematurely, but some really exciting things coming out is, there's an institute called the Sears X Institute, CIRS X Institute, and they're coming out with a training course, a 101 for remediation. I know because I'm one of the authors and, and it's going to be debuted. Now it's intended for um, remediation professionals and it, it takes it to that medically grade type remediation and cleaning following all of these practices in a much more succinct and easy to understand manner, but it could be, it's available for anybody. So mm -hmm. if you're that DIY person, and you're like, well, man, I, I at least want to be really, you know, really prepared. We're going to have some resources available for y'all. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that to market it, but I'm trying to be realistic with your ability to find free uh, resources. Some of them are free, some of them are not, to help educate you, to help ensure that when the remediation is being done, you don't have a botched job where somebody's going to come out there with a um, half. I'll, I'll use another term, but half-efforted containment setup. And that their 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 main way of cleaning your surfaces involves only a HEPA vacuum. That's not enough, and you'll probably still have a contaminated environment. So I'm going to summarize really quickly something Please. that I think is relevant to both what we're talking about today and to homeopathy. And the, what I, I just come to is slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Like we want things to be done and gone tomorrow, but sometimes we can actually slow things down and by stumbling and trying to move too quickly instead of moving intentionally and smartly. So like slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Like you can get there better if you're not having to go back and and like redo things and make up for mistakes and um and trying to force the body and creating more problems like in the healing part with the body if you're trying to force the body by trying to make things go faster and then you create another problem because then you have a side effect of this particular thing that you took or it didn't work well or you killed too many things here and you created more dysbiosis in this way so um yeah slow is smooth and smooth is fast <laughs> and all and anybody in the military or special forces is is resonating with the with the uh, the expression and and i say something very similar is let's slow down to speed up for the same exact reason yeah. is 
we want to get it done. I hear you. I see you. I feel you. I understand that. But if you do it, you're going to trip over yourself on one of these steps, and then you're really going to be upset. And yeah. and so if you trust that process and you trust the people you're working with, then you need to trust to let that play out. If you're having issues where you don't trust the process, then there's other issues that we need to look at. Yeah, I guess I just showed my military background, huh? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, fortunately, I think this is something that the PANS community is starting to grasp and understand. It's just such a hard thing because we want to move so fast and fix and and help our kids, help our families, everything so fast. But it is, um, you know, slow and smooth makes a whole lot of sense. And I think we see it over time is um, the the slower we go the more progress that we make. Um, so what about a good remediation? What does that look like? And, uh, you know, how long will it take? And I, I know the answer to this varies widely, but uh, like how much average cost? Yeah, I guess it's all about personal experience, um, uh, what the situation is uh, and where you live, the demographics, all that plays. But you know, in mold remediation projects, if, if this, uh, Jody, if I don't answer your question enough, uh, let me know. But, uh, you know, we might have one or two areas that are under containment. Maybe it's that kitchen sink uh, that has mold underneath the bottom shelf from a drip leak that one of the spouses thought wasn't an issue. Or maybe it was um, uh, the humidity um, uh, that got into the home and it resulted in topical condensation and growth. And now you're you're cleaning out a room or what? There's all kinds of scenarios, right? Um, cost wise, you know, it might only be with professional boots, we have to ask what's the scope of work? Well, let's just say it's um, two containment areas, and they're only focused on the areas inside the containment, it might be anywhere from two to five grand on average. Is it a nice cabinet? You got granite countertops? Did they break when they remediated them? The numbers can go up from there, which is one of the reasons why you ask for an estimate before you execute the estimate, maybe it's too much. That's why you get estimates to see what they cost. But then you have to think about the areas outside of the containment. Um, so um, if we, and again, ladies, feel free to um, prompt me to dive deeper. But if we assume that you need to clean the whole house, you know, that's a whole other cost. In fact, what we hear and see a lot of times is that um, the biggest part of the cost is the cleaning at areas outside of the home, the or outside of the containments, rather, the, the contents, the surfaces. That could be anywhere from, say, $5,000 and up into extreme numbers like $40,000, $50,000. It really depends. Um, mm -hmm. Just as a quick, uh, if any of you hear that and you have, oh, my gosh, hey, it's all good. There are uh, DIY cleaning methods. There are hybrid solutions that don't involve the mold remediation company, but maybe a cleaning service that's willing to follow instructions. When you get into hybrid or flat out DIY, you want to think, I got to add an IEP. Um, I, I'm saying, and I, I, I don't like when I do this, but I don't, I don't know how else to explain it. Like myself, you want to have involved so that, that you can, can be your quarterback. So you can say, okay, no, nope, don't do that but do that first. Oh, okay. Okay. That's why we clean the ducks first. And then we clean the home. Oh, okay. The order matters. Okay. You need to have somebody there to do it or else it'll be that whole too quickly rush, 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 go, go, go. Don't, don't, don't think. And all of a sudden you have that problem, but it says to sum it up two to five grand for maybe one or two modest containment areas, but it can go up. And, 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 and just because it can go up, doesn't mean you necessarily have to do that more expensive thing. If you have a moldy crawl space, and you have to remediate it and condition it so that it doesn't become a problem in the future, you might spend ten, fifteen, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 or more to have it fixed. But that doesn't mean that you have to feel the stress or anxiety of having to do that. There's a lot of other options if you're in a budget tight situation where we can focus on the living spaces immediately and then get to those other areas as time allows. And I, sorry, I was projecting a little bit because I'm assuming that there's a few of you listening right now that are going, oh my God, yeah, my budget's three grand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's some people yeah. who like three grand is, is unattainable too, you know, just depending on where people are at. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm super curious about, um, the the DIY you brought that up many many times and obviously the best situation is if you are able to at, at the very least consult with somebody to give you some guidance yep. um, and we're going to put all the resources and, and please hype yourself up as much as you need to there's a reason we asked you here to talk to us because you have expertise that uh, people need to hear right um, and so with the the um, what was the IEP radio that you have and the, yeah. the courses that you've got there um, right. again we'll put the links to it in the show notes so people can access them e easily. Um, 
do you have stuff there that people could follow for like the DIY process or is that really something that they would need to talk to you to figure out their unique situation? Yeah, probably the latter. I mean, don't get me wrong. The IEP radio has uh, four episodes on there, that series, which is fundamentally great because it does give you like an example and it throw, it walks you through the stages, the sequencing, but it's not all encompassing, right? Like we didn't talk about a crawl space in that scenario. I don't even know that we talked about dealing mm -hmm. with the HVAC system at that time, but I think it'll wake up many of the listeners needing it and going, okay, I, okay, wow. Okay. That's yep. I get it now. And now you're down to saying, okay, now what about my specific situation? And so absolutely work with an IEP uh, that can help you guide. And, and the reason I, again, just to stress this point, the reason I say work with an IEP, work with an IEP is because, um, and remind me to tell you about the resources available in ICI, um, is, uh, we, we we come to the back end of a lot of it. A lot of times people reach out to us and say, oh, you know, we went in, so we're trying to save money. And so we did it ourselves. And, or, or my spouse, typically it's the husband, sorry guys, um, that are, is, didn't want to do it. And, and, and then we did it. And now I did a sample and I'm freaking out. It's way worse. And you come to find out that the person that did the work just didn't have that knowledge. So work with an IEP. Mm -hmm. The other, the other thing too, is the ICI. So I'm, I'm sure Jennifer or Jody will uh, post resources, but I'm a part of the IEP committee and board of the I, of ICI, which is a nonprofit 5013C uh, organization where there's clinicians and IEPs like me, by the way, another great resource to look around. Um, and there's free resources, there's free handouts that have that we've spent hundreds of hours working on as a committee for free, uh, volunteering our time to offer to you a handout that has like a lot of the go-to things, the questions and concerns you have. There is a handout on remediation, a fact sheet. There's re there's there's a fact sheet on testing and the differences between the samples. Should have mentioned that earlier, but make sure you go to that. That's an excellent way to learn more. Yeah. Super useful. Thank you. You yeah. you said something a second ago, and I have to ask, throw a curveball question at you here. Um, it, it let's say hypothetically, my husband doesn't believe that this mold is a problem. <laughs> yes, that this mold is a problem, and even after it's tested, it's still not that big of a deal. Do you have any advice, um, just anything, any way to talk to a spouse that doesn't believe or I, even resources? You probably have the perfect words. Yes. Um, it, let's, let's caveat it with this is a spouse that doesn't want to listen to you. The other spouse doesn't want to listen to your resources or the podcast that you found or whatever. You need to make sure that you have your husband or oops, your, your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> show up uh, when we do a Zoom uh, consultation. If we have a hypothetical situation and you need some direction, make sure your spouse is mm -hmm. present because jokes, humor aside, I really mean what I'm saying. And, 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 and in all seriousness, your spouse needs to be heard. Part of the problem is very elementary that most of us deal with in our own relationships is that your spouse is not feeling heard or they're having their own fear and anxiety and you're freaking them out because whether you're balanced in your own concerns or you're one of those people that are freaking out about 10 different things and two of them are probably a little bit excessive and not needed, but the other eight are, your husband's going to focus, oh, your spouse is going to focus on the other <laughs> two of the 10 and, and discredit you on the eight of the 10. You need a environmental counselor who can show that they're being heard. And unfortunately, they don't do coursework for that. There's no certification. <laughs> I can tell you I'm really good at it. And I've taken many um, uh, spouses, many engineer minds, many scientists, um, literally rocket scientists and all that sort of things, surgeons, and brought them down into an understanding of saying, well, you're saying that this is baloney. Where's your research? And I don't say it in such an accusational way, of course, because that's how you kill a conversation, but you lead them to the truth through making them seem and felt heard. And unfortunately, if you're that spouse that's jumping up and down in your car or going, oh my God, that's what I'm going through right now. That's the part where you need to reach out to a professional. And yeah, maybe you need your own counselor, but you need somebody who understands the environment too, so that we can explain why this is or isn't okay. And don't worry, I'm not gonna overstep my bounds. If we don't have evidence that it's not a problem, I'm not gonna say it's a problem. We're gonna use yeah. reasonable rationale to be able to explain what is and what isn't, state the limitations so everybody feels heard and ultimately get to the, the uh, finish line. I have found that to work 99% of the time. I can't even recall a situation with a, uh, an opposing spouse where it didn't work. Nice. 
So I have to ask you a question about a, a nightmare sit story that you we hear. Everybody's heard it at least once, probably a handful of times, where basically they say, if you have mold in your home, you need to burn everything down, leave it all behind, move across the country, Ooh. like nothing. You can take nothing with you. If, if there is ever a piece of dust on it, it's dead to you. Um, is that really true? Like, do you really have to leave everything behind? Clothes, I need to drink right? a water for this one. Hold on. <laughs> Yeah, so um, no, I, I think that um, that's an old observation and a valid current one as well. 99% of the time, in my experience, it's not that extreme. 80% of the time, those are the stories that you read about on the social media groups and the blogs because people are great at blogging and talking about their problems accentuating their fears, but they're not mm -hmm. really good at telling you the success stories. Um, that's just the way it is. Here you there. <laughs> right, right, right. And the media and all that. I mean, we're there, right? Um, we are living, I say a lot of this with repetition, on earth. We are surrounded by mold. I have a, a board over here that I write on when I have a one of my few good ideas. And one of the phrases that, um, or analogies I offer is it's funny how, this is, pertains to the question about moving and the extremeness of it all. It's funny how prejudiced we are. Hear me out. If it's a mold spore, let's call it Stacky. Stacky Bacher Shatarm, that Tom Cruise celebrity mold we talked about earlier. It came from the outside and rest assured it does. All molds come from the outside at one point in their life cycle. It didn't come from Mars from a space shuttle. <laughs> and it lands on your t-shirt. You don't think twice about it. Not because you didn't know it. Let's just say you knew about it. A reasonable person would say, okay, whatever. I'm going to launder it. I'm going I'm to wipe it off like you just did. Normal. <laughs> the second that same species, same strain, just for all you nerds out there, grows in the home, we treat it like it's plutonium. Land it on your shirt. Throw it out. Burn it out. Burn the house down. We are prejudiced, the industry, and I don't mean to include me, we in that because I fight this issue left and right, but- it's not that extreme. What, what you have are situations where less than 1% of the time, you will have a situation. There was that big Texas story, um, million dollar loss. Most of the home was damaged and it was easier to burn the house down and rebuild it. Or that you run into a situation where um, it's an old home and it's a building defect and moisture is getting into all of the exterior walls. And by the time you get done rebuilding it, it's three quarters of the value of the home. You might as well just rebuild from the ground up. There's all there's situations like that. Those are so rare. Those are the outlaws. Those are like the far outliers. Um, most of the time, it's about risk management. It's about saying, look, whoa, 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 let's let's take a look here. You have an issue in your crawl space. Got it. Got an issue in your air conditioning system. Got it. Okay. Let's look at containing the situation, preventing it from causing any more issues. Oh, your contents, I got to throw everything out. Do you? Why do you, why do you have to throw it out? Well, because I read that mycotoxins can permeate into a book and you can't remove it from it. It'll just stay there. That's an interesting concept. If it will stay there, what's the exposure concern? Think about that for a second. And the point is, is that you don't have to throw things out. In many situations, it's put the items in a plastic container, sealed bin, vacuum bag, take it out of the home if possible. If not, if it's in that plastic sealed container in your home, we're not really worried about it because it's contained and you deal with it. Um, I've worked with over 6,000 clients um, and there's certainly some repeat clients in that number. And I can tell you that it has been seldom, I think maybe four or five uh, of those clients, it was legit, but it was so legit. It was obvious. Even the person that is, wouldn't even ask that question that you're asking me, it would be obvious because it's mold everywhere. It's like not even realistic. Mm -hmm. It was a house that was just left alone and there's mold growing on every square inch of everything. And it's like the value to clean this. It just doesn't make sense. Most of the time it's quite the opposite and it boils down to risk management. So uh, you might say, okay, Mike, um, we were going to clean the ducts. We're going to address the crawl space, we're going to clean the home, and our house is going to reflect the normal fungal ecology. Yes, that is correct. That happens every day of the week. And you're just not hearing those stories. You're hearing the glossy versions of horror stories because people want to voice their concern and feel heard and feel safe. And, and they're just desperate for answers. And that is not a healthy way of going about it. Yeah, when people are struggling is when they need the most support. When, people, when things are going fine, they're going as expected. Nobody needs to come in and get support or, or help or, or share well about said. that so much. Well said. Yeah. yeah.
What uh, what about preventative measures? What can we do in our home to help prevent it? Things like AC cleaning and humidity monitors and mm -hmm. leak prevention building recommendations, stuff like that. Yeah. So the first thing we always say is prevention, keep the house dry. Um, if it's obviously there's some obvious things there, like don't have a roof leak or don't have a plumbing leak. And um, certainly if you're doing normal inspections, your roofing inspection, whether it's a pitched roof or a flat roof, you could always look at the integrity of it and keep your eyes open. Um, um, it depends on how deep we want to go with how proactive, but I'll just give you the low, the lowest stuff right now, the easy stuff. Also want to make sure the house is dry, relatively speaking. I mean, if you live in an environment like, the, like say in Georgia near the ocean, uh, or, or Houston, Texas, um, you're dealing with so much moisture in the air that a lot of times if we're needing to condition the home, especially if it's a newer home, and by new, I don't mean five years old, I mean, like, say, 1950s or newer, you're going to need to dehumidify the home, which means you'll need supplemental dehumidification. Do you have to do dehumidification? No, you can live like a, an Ohana in Hawaii and just open up your windows and have air moving through it. And it's going to feel like a a little bit of a wind tunnel, and that will actually help prevent mold growth. But that's not realistic for somebody living in a hot, humid climate. And so um, keeping the house dry, um, it depends on the, the season, time of year, whatever. But, you know, we like to say target 50, 55 percent relative humidity in the home or less. Namely, that's in the summertime, because that's when the, the air is warmer, can hold more moisture. And 55 percent at 100 degrees is a lot more moisture in the air available than 55% relative humidity at 50 degrees in the air. That's why it's called relative humidity. It depends on the temperature. Um, the other things that you can do is just keep that house clean. So like routine cleaning, right? I mean, if you're, um, I was gonna say hoarder, if, if you have a lot of contents and a lot of stuff, and a lot of people do, um, we got a couple of kids running around the house and it feels overwhelming at times with stuff that we get and all that, is you try to declutter the house. Why? It's less surface area. Why do we care about surface area? It's less stuff to build up and clean, less opportunity for things to grow, less nutrients to build up in your home. Keeping the house clean with just normal routine cleaning, like dusting a Swiffer cloth. It's funny, I have one, uh, I was messing with one in my office earlier, you know, Swiffer, Swiffer, and, and clean the house, that sort of thing. But the other thing you could do too is, um, again, this is not necessarily prevention of growth, but um, really just helping improve the indoor air quality. I don't want to jump ahead to any other questions, but is is filtration and considering certain purification devices to help improve the indoor air quality. If you keep the house dry, if you keep the moisture away from the home, think um, drainage towards the house versus away from the house, think um, irrigation and drip drip lines that are dripping water by a bush next to your home and it's getting the crawl space wet. If you can keep the moisture away, it really quite, doesn't really matter how dirty your home is or how many mold spores are in your house. Mold's not going to germinate and grow if you keep it dry. So that would be the biggest thing to land this airplane that you can do to prevent mold from growing. So now that you mentioned purifiers, like do air, par air purifiers help? Um, and are there any that are better than others or are they not really that necessary? What I can tell you is that air filtration is different than air purification. Air filtration is the physical removal, whether the HEPA filter or carbon for absorb, like to remove chemicals. Mm -hmm. And that, yes, they can, they can definitely reduce levels in the air. I think they're overmarketed. I think um, people have uh, grandiose ideas of how like a unit in their living room is somehow like filtering all of the air. It is not. Um, uh, the way that you think it is. Um, but with purification, I've kind of changed my tune a little bit. It used to be always, and, and you'll see this reflected in my, my radio class, my podcast on IEP radio, is that we want to be really careful about purification technologies because of things like byproducts. A lot of people, when they hear byproducts, they think ozone, and that's a big one. Mm -hmm. um, UV light, certain frequencies, wavelengths can create ozone, and that's a byproduct that you don't want to have. Uh, if you take an ozone generator into a candle store at a mall, not that I think they make those anymore, one of the byproducts is formaldehyde. That's a, that's a byproduct. Well, there's a lot that we still don't know about byproduct production creation. And we've seen anecdotally stories or situations where a person says they feel worse when they add purification. So what's purification? Um, ionization, hydroxyl radicals, ozone's an older school one that most companies are actually kind of getting away from because they, ozone's a kind of a bad word now, like mold, um, to, to, to utilize in concert. What I will tell you, though, is that there's certain companies out there that make a both. I'm not afraid to tell you about, I don't have any financial ties with uh, Air Oasis 
Um, and they have a unit called the I Adapt Air. I have one running in my office right now. Um, and it's got both. And I'm not, I I'm not telling you that you need to go out and buy a bunch. What I'm telling you is, is that we've seen people that have used these devices and um, they've actually reported better reactions, anecdotally feeling better than if it was just a normal um, HEPA air filtration device, a scrubber, a Honeywell unit that you buy online for $260 or something like that. And so to summarize that, I think if you are one of those individuals or have a family member who's really extremely sensitive, and you know that it's multifactorial, maybe a little bit it's limbic, a little bit it's just the toxicity of your situation, maybe it's the home itself, um, I would keep it simple and go with a HEPA air filtration device, a mm -hmm. portable HEPA unit. Um, and again, if you can't afford a, a, a HEPA filtration device, because you look on, online and some of these units are $300, $400, you know, they have other options. They have DIY options like a Corsi Rosenthal box, which is basically four filters that are not HEPA with a box fan on it. You know, user beware, caution, don't light your house on fire. But there's options out there to filter the air out. But if you got a little bit of wiggle room, if you have some financial wiggle room and 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 you're you don't feel like you're so sensitive, you might try a unit like an iAdapt Air from Air Oasis because they come with and, and and I'm not their marketer, I just know their site and a few others quite well, is they have a 60 day money back, no hassle guarantee. So you try the unit out for 10 or 15 days, and if you don't like it, send it back. Mm -hmm. And 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 that way you feel safe. You feel like I didn't just spend four, five, six hundred dollars on a unit, and now I'm stuck with it. Those units, I think, are great supplemental. I think you have to look at them. Final thought as a per room situation. I know that they have things. This unit good for up to this many square feet or that. That's not based off of somebody with pans or pandas. That's not based off of somebody with CRS or Lyme. That's mm -hmm. based off of a non medical reference to help establish. Um, unity or e being equal among other units to have a comparison based off of how they actually are performing. You want to think about, I need a big unit in one room. If I'm in a room in an office, I need two units. If I'm in a room in an office in a bedroom, or let's say a living room, I might need to buy four units. Don't feel the pressure or the anxiety that you have to have them. But these are the things that we would talk about if we were consulting with you. It's like, well, let's take a look at what you got right now. Oh, you can't afford that. Well, let's have you buy one of these and two of those. Because there isn't a play sheet that says, if you have pans or pandas and you're you have you're this blood type and it's this square footage with this ceiling height with carpeting, you definitely need this unit, this other unit, and that unit. That you have to look at the particulars of the home to ask ourselves, do we think that that's going to be enough to lower the particles enough to help make a difference in your life? Nothing is algorithmic. Like there is no clear cut answers to things. You know, we not unless you make it into a wind tunnel. tunnel. We could turn your house into a clean room, which would be financially <laughs> impossible, <laughs> not realistic. And then we'll really lower those levels down. But that's not a lifestyle you're going to want to live. Well, I mean, this is it, this connects. I, I appreciate this so much because it connects so much with with our expertise again with homeopathy. But like, it has to be individualized. It's you're not going to be. There's not like one answer for anybody. Like for everybody, it's like one answer for this person and this circumstances and these sensitivities and this susceptibility so right I exactly that. what do you uh what do you recommend as far as um those of us that feel like we could potentially be dealing with mold in school or at work or even when we go on vacation and this is a super personal one to me right now because i think i'm there and i'm not sure what my first step should be as far as approaching school or even how to go about any of it so you're talking about as um, from your context, like as a mom with kids and the concerns of the kids. Okay. Yeah. Um, makes sense. Um, so first thing I would tell you is see if there's any way that you can look up state uh, rights um, for health and good health for schools, because you might find that there is a law or a regulation that gives you at least enough to they, that they recognize you have a voice because some people will try to shut you down before you ever pick up the phone call, so to speak, to where no matter what you have to say, they're going to get really posturing in a defensive way. And you want to know that you have your rights. And that's where you find that out. I don't have a resource for that. Unfortunately, I, I, uh, maybe next time we talk, I, I, I can look into that. But the point is, is, is you would do that. A big thing is a doctor's note. Um, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a school turn into the positive of one, willing to help. There's a couple of tricky things they'll do. But if you let them know, no, this is my son or daughter has this, here's the doctor's note, and the doctor's note include, includes a concern for mold exposure. We might not know what's going on in that school, but yeah. perhaps 
symptoms of the of the way that the child is being or or what other metric they're using blood urine whatever is indicative of um an exposure going on and 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 the doctor's note um again this gets into my own world and what i see and what i do and and i don't know if it'll fit everyone's picture perfectly but it's also making sure you have the ability to pick out the right inspector because what we see happen is is the the school will listen to what you have to say in some situations and then they'll they'll be quote unquote proactive and they will hire a company that does traditional sampling. They will come out to the school. They will sample your kid's schoolroom with a five-minute spore trap sample, which is a grab sample. It's not statistically significant whatsoever. And they were, they're more likely to not find a problem and therefore conclude falsely that there's no problem in the school. You need to find a knowledgeable IEP, even if it means working with one virtually like myself to start with. Because maybe you don't know if there's a knowledgeable person out there. If you don't know of a Mike Schrantz or a few others that uh, colleagues of mine, you know, who, where do you go? Then yeah. you would at least work with somebody virtually. And I would have you schedule a meeting. In other words, before it gets too hot and heavy, before all the posturing gets all real official, is tell them, I have this concern and I want to meet with you, um, with my inspector, to just have a conversation. Just to make sure we're all on the page. Nothing official, no commitments to anything. But I, I, the, what we say mm -hmm. matters. And mm -hmm. if you just come in with, oh, you better do this, yeah, they're going to shut down because they're going to think you're unstable and that you're a threat. And, and I'm with you because I care about your kid. And I want your kid to have a, 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 the, how the school assessed to get a fair take on what's going on. But in short, just to kind of recap for everybody, is check out your state regulations and laws that would say, do I have a voice here? And how, do they, how are schools how do they have to listen to you? Like, do you have a voice? How does that process work? Get a doctor's note, definitely make it as detailed as possible. My son or daughter has X and, and we're concerned about mold because of this. And therefore we want a qualified mold inspector who understands this illness. I didn't say that before. I'm adding that right now. And then the third thing is, is in getting the school to cooperate with you. If, unless you know somebody like myself in your area that can just show up to the school and they say, fine, you hire this person is work with an IEP like myself virtually so that we can talk with them in a very productive manner and say the right things to where they don't try to wiggle out of it. I don't mean to make every school sound like they're bad. There's some good schools out there. But for the ones that don't want to cooperate or just are naive, they might hire a company that doesn't know what they're doing, test the house out the wrong or the building out the wrong way, say there's no problem, then come back to you and say, we've done all we're willing to do. Now it's now, you know, we're not willing to do anymore. And unfortunately, we've seen that a number of times. And this is so the, the advice I'm giving you comes off the heels of, of learning those lessons. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. So I have one final question for you before we wrap up today. And that is what is there, is there anything that's like absolute worst case scenario, things people should never do, whether they're doing it on their own or if they're working with a remediation company, like huge mistakes that you see people make when they're in a desperate situation, like. What should they absolutely not do? Uh, could have some fun with that one. Um, <laughs> uh, stay off the social media groups asking for advice. Um, um, okay. There was a there, there, there's that. Um, the th other thing I would do is um, don't panic. Mm -hmm. um, I under I understand to the extent I can what you're going through right now. And it's scary and it's exhausting and it's stressful. And I know that you want to get to the finish line as quickly as possible. Do not make any assumptions. Do not assume worst case. You're going to get through this. You're going to work it out. Slow down and, and, and work with. So the opposite would be if you didn't work with, work with an IEP, somebody who's knowledgeable. You're not going to be spending a mortgage doing all that work. And even if you have to spend anywhere from, say, $300 to $700 to talk to a knowledgeable person with a good amount of time involved in that, in that amount of money, it is worth it. Because how much money are you spending every month on your child's health and well-being? And how much? And, and, and it, that can go on. So don't assume any things. Don't go online and look for advice. I, I'm saying that because in my own experience, which is where you're, you're asking me what my opinion is, we, we, I just saw, um, I won't name names, but I just saw a major mold group on Facebook with uh, tens of thousands of members get shut down uh, recently because of, among other reasons, the suspicion is, is because of the bickering, the back and forth, the negative, it's just negative energy. 
and just so work with people. The other thing too, and this is like a side note is don't spray chemicals. Don't go, don't go crazy. If it sounds too good to, too good to be true, it probably is. Don't mold bomb your house. Don't light up 10 candles because one candle sounded fine. I mean, we have to physically remove the mold or at least the excess mold. We won't, we're not looking for mold free. We're looking for normal fungal ecology. We want some meaningful samples to reflect that post all of your work so that you can feel really comfortable. Work with a professional um, so that you don't make the mistake of doing the same thing that Jennifer echoed earlier. And I'm sure Jody agrees with which is this idea of you go, 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 you get fast, fast, fast. You listen to somebody who says, oh, those IEPs are just trying to make money. Yeah, there's, there's some bad apples out there, but all of us need to make a living too. But if we, you can tell the difference between somebody who wants to put the service first versus a dollar sign first, work with the person that your spotty senses say, this person I can trust and go from there. And in that respect, go visit sites like ICI.org. Um, ACAC is kind of your backup option, but again, you don't really get, um, an emphasis on people that specialize in chronic illness. Whereas with ICI's website on their get help page, it is a better list of people, in my opinion, that are more attuned to be able to help you. That might be closer than some guy in Tucson, Arizona. Yeah. I love the overarching theme here that both Dr. Barr and you have painted because I've been in the PANS community since 2016, and this is the very first time when it comes to mold, I have ever heard the concept of slowing down and not panicking. And I think that's what so many of the moms and dads in this community need to hear is that it's not an immediate like da -da -da, like sprint and get all the things done it it really is um you know going slow methodical coming up with a plan and slowly starting to execute that plan is what's going to give you the best end results and 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 I would almost say to your point that the short version the fast version is is plagued with the opposites of those things, right? It's, it is the mistake. It is now we could have gotten quicker, but now there's been more exposure. And so it slow down to speed up is, is the deal. And, and the hope piece is just because how many cheerleaders are there for all the negative things? When you go online and you see a problem, there's a, and someone's talking about it, that's a cheerleader for the problem. So think about that for how many cheerleaders are available for all the negative stuff. Now I ask that same question for positive. How many cheerleaders are there for hope? Yeah. Hope doesn't sell in too many industries. Problems, fear sells. And that's just the way some people have even been. Their synapses and connections have been trained to be. That's how it is. Your life, it might be feeling in a state of chaos, uh, chaos right now with what you're dealing with, what you're watching your child go through. But if you want that fast track solution, just know our bodies take time to heal, regardless of what treatment or what diagnosis you've been labeled with. The whole point of this is to get you there quicker. That's the irony. If you did nothing, if you didn't remediate your house, if you didn't have supplements, it's possible to say that in the right mindset, you could possibly get better. It may take you a while. It may not be the journey you want to go on. And no, that's not every situation. But if you do it right and you clean the environment and you verify and you have the right hopeful mindset and you don't get sucked into the fear and the anxiety, I can't tell you how many times we've seen people uh, succeed quicker, heal quicker versus the people that are living that other lifestyle. So if that's you, if you're one of those people that you find yourself doing it, feel empowered to say, I don't need to live this. This is not the reality, the drama, the name. There is hope that it sh I should have been like that from day one. And I'm sorry to see that you've gone through that. You should have never had to go through that. And I wish there were more people like us three screaming from the hilltops of all the good news because I see nothing but really good news. Oh, we see challenges that we go mm -hmm. through, but there's solutions. Yeah. And that's the point. Yeah. I love that you ended on such a, a high note uh, because we do like in our community, our, our little community that we serve with the, our Facebook group of, uh, about homeopathy for pans and pandas, we see a, a unusually positive and hopeful and uplifting space mm. um, where hope does seem to be the the theme. We do have people who come and then they need support and then they come back yeah. to share when things get better and they share their hope. And, and mm. we, we really, it, it's so connected to what you do with like the being methodical, taking a look at like the individual and recognizing that there is no like ultra pure state. And so I just, I can't thank you enough for the balanced approach that you brought to this really important topic. It's not something to ignore, but it's also not something oh. to fear. Um, and that there are ways that things can be managed that are, um, 
not just not going to be overwhelming that don't have to be like you you have to just throw your whole life down the toilet and like start over again so there's plenty uh, of resources out there to yes. do just the thing that you said yeah no i yeah. i really appreciate this so much and between the the information that you've shared and then working using homeopathy or other therapies to address that susceptibility you really can even in the face of mold um, mold illness mold exposure you can heal you can recover it doesn't have to cost you a, a arm and a leg might take some time to do it appropriately and to like get all of the things that are contributing to improve. Um, but it is possible and you can recover from these things and live a good life and not have it make you absolutely bankrupt or anything like that. Right. So, um, so grateful for your time. And I, I can't believe we were able to get into so much about all of these different questions that we sent to you. Um, we would love to have you back if we, um, if you get more information or if there are things that you really think we didn't even brush the surface of that people really should know more about to make good decisions. Um, this was a really, a really fantastic conversation and I'm so grateful for your time. I yes. appreciate this opportunity. Thank you both ladies. And I look forward to a future one. Great. Awesome. Take care, Thanks. everybody. Bye guys. We hope you found this episode helpful, hopeful, and inspiring. We try to get a new episode out every week. You can make sure you don't miss any by following us on Spotify or subscribing to our channel on YouTube. If you want to connect with us more, join our Facebook group, Homeopathy for Pans and Pandas, where we have exclusive weekly videos and answer your questions about, you guessed it, Homeopathy for Pans and Pandas throughout the week. If you are already a member, give us a shout out and let us know what you thought about this episode. If you aren't on Facebook and would like to reach us, you can email us at podcast at resiliencenaturopathic.com. Until next time, take care and remember, this won't be forever.